Last of the Mohicans by James Fenimore Cooper. It was a feature peculiar to the colonial wars of North America that the toils and dangers of the wilderness were to be encountered before the adverse hosts could meet. A wide and apparently an impervious boundary of forests severed the possessions of the hostile provinces of France and England. The hardy colonist and the trained European who fought at his side frequently expended months in struggling against the rapids of the streams or in effecting the rugged passes of the mountains in quest of an opportunity to exhibit their courage in a more martial conflict. But, emulating the patience and self-denial of the practiced native warriors, they learned to overcome every difficulty. And it would seem that in time there was no recess of the wood so dark, nor any secret place so lovely, that it might claim exemption from the inroads of those who had pledged their blood to satiate their vengeance, or to uphold the cold and selfish policy of the distant monarchs of Europe. It was in this scene that the incidents we shall attempt to relate occurred, during the third year of the war which England and France last waged for the possession of a country that neither was destined to retain. The imbecility of her military leaders abroad, and the fatal want of energy in her councils at home, had lowered the character of Great Britain from the proud elevation on which it had been placed by the talents and enterprise of her former warriors and statesmen. No longer dreaded by her enemies, her servants were fast losing the confidence of self-respect. When, therefore, intelligence was received at Fort Edward, which covered the southern termination of the portage between the Hudson and the lakes, that Montcalm had been seen moving up the Champlain River with an army numerous as the leaves on the trees, its truth was admitted with more of the craven reluctance of fear than with the stern joy that a warrior should feel in finding an enemy within reach of his blow. The news had been brought, toward the decline of a day in midsummer, by an Indian runner, who also bore an urgent request from Monroe, the commander of Fort William Henry, a work on the shore of the Holy Lake, for a speedy and powerful reinforcement. After the first surprise of the intelligence had a little abated, a rumor was spread through the entrenched camp, which stretched along the margin of the Hudson, forming a chain of outworks to the body of the fort itself, that a chosen detachment of fifteen hundred men was to depart, with the dawn, for William Henry. The next day the heavy sleep of the army was broken by the rolling of the warning drums, whose rattling echoes were heard issuing on the damp morning air, out of every vista of the woods, just as day began to draw the shaggy outlines of some tall pines of the vicinity on the opening brightness of a soft and cloudless eastern sky. In an instant the whole camp was in motion, the meanest soldier arousing from his lair to witness the departure of his comrades, and to share in the excitement and incidents of the hour. The scouts departed. Strong guards preceded and followed the lumbering vehicles that bore the baggage, and before the grey light of the morning was mellowed by the rays of the sun, the main body of the combatants wheeled into column and left the encampment with a show of high military bearing that served to drown the slumbering apprehensions of many a novice who was now about to make his first essay in arms. While in view of their admiring comrades, the same proud front and ordered array was observed, until the notes of their fifes growing fainter in distance, the forest at length appeared to swallow up the living mass which had slowly entered its bosom. The deepest sounds of the retiring and invisible column had ceased to be borne on the breeze to the listeners, and the latest straggler had already disappeared in pursuit, but there still remained the signs of another departure, before a log cabin of unusual size and accommodations, in front of which those sentinels paced their rounds who were known to guard the person of Webb, the English general. A young man, Major Duncan Hayward, in the dress of an officer, conducted to their steeds two females, who, as it was apparent by their dresses, were prepared to encounter the fatigues of a journey in the woods. One, 
and she was the most juvenile in her appearance, though both were young, permitted glimpses of her dazzling complexion, fair golden hair, and bright blue eyes to be caught as she artlessly suffered the morning air to blow aside the green veil which descended low from her hat. The other, who appeared to share equally in the attentions of the young officer, concealed her charms from the gaze of the soldiery with a care that seemed better fitted to the experience of four or five additional years. It could be seen, however, that her person, though moulded with the same exquisite proportions, of which none of the graces were lost by the travelling dress she wore, was rather fuller and more mature than that of her companion. No sooner were these females seated than Hayward sprang lightly into the saddle of the war-horse, when the whole three bowed to General Webb, who, in courtesy, awaited their parting on the threshold of his cabin, and, turning their horses' heads, they proceeded at a slow amble, followed by their train, toward the northern entrance of the encampment. As they traversed that short distance, not a voice was heard amongst them, but a slight exclamation proceeded from the younger of the females, as their Indian runner, Magua, glided by her unexpectedly and led the way along the military road in her front. Quickly recovering from the alarm which induced the exclamation, and laughing at her own weakness, she inquired of the youth who rode by her side, Are such spectres frequent in the woods, Hayward, or is this sight an especial entertainment ordered on our behalf? Yon Indian is a runner of the army, and after the fashion of his people he may be accounted a hero, returned the officer. He has volunteered to guide us to the lake, by a path but little known, sooner than if we followed the tardy movements of the column, and by consequence more agreeably. I like him not, said the lady, shuddering, partly in assumed, yet more in real terror. You know him, Duncan, or you would not trust yourself so freely to his keeping. Say rather, Alice, that I would not trust you— I do know him, or he would not have my confidence, least of all at this moment. He is said to be a Canadian, too, and yet he served with our friends the Mohawks, who, as you know, are one of the six allied nations. He was brought amongst us, as I have heard, by some strange accident in which your father was interested, and in which the savage was rigidly dealt by. But I forget the idle tale. It is enough that he is now our friend. But he stops. The private path by which we are to journey is doubtless at hand. Manifest no distrust, or you may invite the danger you appear to apprehend. Cora, what think you? asked Alice. If we journey with the troops, though we may find their presence irksome, shall we not feel better assurance of our safety? Being little accustomed to the practices of the savages, Alice, you mistake the place of real danger, said Hayward. If enemies have reached the portage at all, a thing by no means probable, as our scouts are abroad, they will surely be found skirting the column, where scalps abound the most. The route of the detachment is known, while ours, having been determined within the hour, must still be secret. Should we distrust the man because his manners are not our manners, and that his skin is dark? coldly asked Cora. Alice hesitated no longer, but giving her horse a smart cut of the whip, she was the first to dash aside the slight branches of the bushes, and to follow the runner along the dark and tangled pathway. For many minutes the intricacy of the route admitted of no further dialogue, after which they emerged from the broad border of underbrush which grew along the line of the highway, and entered under the high but dark arches of the forest. Here their progress was less interrupted, and the instant the guide perceived that the females could command their steeds, he moved on at a pace between a trot and a walk, and at a rate which kept the sure-footed and peculiar animals they rode at a fast yet easy amble. The youth had turned to speak to the dark-eyed Cora, when the distant sounds of horses' hooves clattering over the roots of the broken way in his rear caused him to check his charger, and as his companions drew their reins at the same instant, the whole party came to a halt in order to obtain an explanation of the unlooked-for interruption. In a few moments, a colt was seen gliding like a fallow deer amongst the straight trunks of the pines, and in another instant the person of an ungainly man came into view, with as much rapidity as he could excite his meagre beast to endure without coming to an open rupture. "'Seek you any here?' demanded Hayward, 
when the other had arrived sufficiently nigh to abate his speed. I trust you are no messenger of evil tidings. Even so, replied the stranger, I hear you are riding to William Henry. As I am journeying thitherward myself, I concluded good company would seem consistent to the wishes of both parties. You appear to possess the privilege of a casting vote, returned Hayward. We are three, whilst you have consulted no one but yourself. Even so, the first point to be obtained is to know one's own mind. One sure of that, and where women are concerned it is not easy, the next is to act up to the decision. I have endeavoured to do both, and here I am. If you journey to the lake, you have mistaken your route, said Hayward haughtily. The highway thither is at least half a mile behind you. Even so, returned the stranger, nothing daunted by this cold reception. It is not prudent for any one of my profession to be too familiar with those he has to instruct, for which reason I follow not the line of the army. Besides which, I conclude that a gentleman of your character has the best judgment in matters of wayfaring. I have therefore decided to join company, in order that the ride may be made more agreeable and partake of social communion. A most arbitrary, if not a hasty decision, exclaimed Hayward. But you speak of instruction? The stranger regarded his interrogator a moment in wonder, and then, losing every mark of self-satisfaction in an expression of solemn humility, he answered, I lay claim to no higher gift than a small insight into the glorious art of petitioning and thanksgiving, as practiced in psalmody. The name is David Gamut, singing master. The man is most manifestly a disciple of Apollo, cried the amused Alice, and I take him under my own especial protection. I am glad to encounter thee, friend, continued the maiden, waving her hand to the stranger to proceed, as she urged her horse to renew its amble. Mm -hmm.